we started our service today, our hymn was, It Is Well With My Soul. And when you look in the hymnal, when you, when you look at any hymnal, there are verses that have little arrows next to them. And sometimes a verse won't have a little arrow next to it. And if you look at It Is Well With My Soul, the second verse doesn't have a little arrow next to it. What that means is most of the time when you hear It Is Well saying, the second verse is not saying. For whatever reason, I, I have no idea how they pick which verses are the best. Uh, in my opinion, however, leaving out the second verse of it as well is a catastrophic mistake. Because there is a lot of good theology, I believe, in that verse. Now the first half, just the first half of that verse says, Satan may buffet, though trials may come. Though Satan may buffet though trials may come. And if you know anything about the writer of that song, Horatio Stafford, you will understand that he and his family understood trials. And most people know about his life up until him writing that song. They know that he lost a son, he and his wife, Anna, they lost a son to scarlet fever. They know that he lost most of his investments in the great Chicago fire of 1870. They realized that because of all of this, Horatio decided that his family needed a vacation. So they were vacationing in England because he was good friends with D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody was going to be preaching in England that year. And so they're going to go on a vacation off to England. And, and the story goes, and many people know it, that he was called away on business. So he's, he didn't want to delay his family's vacation. So he sends them ahead. Well, the ship that his family is on gets into a shipwreck. His wife is saved. His three daughters perish. And the legend says that as Horatio is going to get his wife from England, that he sails over the very spot where that ship had sank and his three daughters had perished. And that's when he begins to write, It is well with my soul. Most people know the story of the Stafford's life to that point. And you can see they were no strangers to try. But to really see how the trials took part in their life, you have to know the story after all of that. There's a popular um, radio announcer who is now deceased that whenever he would come on, he would say, and that's the rest of the story. You see, some of you know it. Well, this is the rest of the story about the Staffords. So Horatio Stafford goes and he gets his wife from England. They come back and uh, they were devout, devout Presbyterians. And so he comes back and he's, going, he's even on the board at his church. And we know after a tragedy like that, you would want the support and the love of your church family. The Staffords were ostracized by their church. As a matter of fact, the church said that there is no way that there can't be some hidden sin in your life in order for God to punish you in the way that he's punished you. And so Horatio, we want you to resign from your position in the board and you and Anna, we would like you to leave the church. So much for Christian love. In their greatest time of need, the people that you would think would put their arms around them told them, we don't want you here. The Staffords were no strangers to trials. After this event, they had other children. It is believed that perhaps they lost one more child. That's four. Staffords were no strangers to trials. Well, so time goes on and eventually they moved to Jerusalem. They start a colony in Jerusalem called the American Colony in Jerusalem. It goes on to become quite successful. Now, shortly before his 60th birthday, Horatio Stafford died. And it is believed that perhaps several years before his death, he was suffering from mental illness. No stranger to trials. So you can understand, though Satan may buffet, though trials will come. And so the reason that I stand before you today, my brothers and sisters, as we begin our study of the book of James is to say to you that it is not a matter of if trials will come in our lives. It is not a matter of if trials will come in my life or if trials will come in your life. Trials will 
come in your life. And so we're going to talk about dealing with trials. Dealing with trials. Our text for this morning, since we are starting our study of James, will come from James, the first chapter, the first through the twelfth verse. James 1, 1 through 12. Will all who are able please stand in reverence to God's word? Now, the text, as it appears on the screen, may be a little bit different from what you hear me read. The text on the screen is the NIV text. I will be reading from today's NIV, which is a slightly different version. James 1, 1 through 12. James, a servant of God, of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. Greetings. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives graciously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of sea blown and tossed by the wind. Those who doubt should not think that they will receive anything from the Lord. They are double-minded and unstable in all they do. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation since they will pass away like a wild flower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and wretches the plant, its blossoms fall and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. Blessed are those who persevere under trials because when they have stood the test, they will receive the crown of life that God had promised to those who love him. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. He may be seated. So we start our study of James today. Now, James, what do we know about him? Well, I can tell you what we know about him from just reading his book. He does not mince words. He does not worry about hurting your feelings. He does not worry about offending. James, when you read it, can be a very offensive and a very hurt feelings type book. That's okay. Now, there's some things that we consider about James. It is believed that the writer of James is the brother, a half-brother of Jesus Christ. James did not believe in his brother's divinity. I mean, think about it. You grow up with somebody, those of you who have brothers or sisters, you grow up with somebody saying, hey, you know what? I'm the Messiah. And really? No, you're my brother. Come on. So James didn't believe it until after Jesus appeared to him after the death. And then he became a wholehearted believer. He went on to become the leader of the church in Jerusalem. It is believed that this book, James, was written very shortly after Jesus' ascension into heaven. And so... It's written primarily to Jews because the church at that time was made mostly of Jews. But it is a letter of instruction. It is a letter of doctrine. It is a letter of how one should carry themselves as a Christian, which is written to the church at the time. And so what does he start out by saying? He starts out by saying something very peculiar. He says, consider it pure joy. Pure joy when you face trials. Now, initially, you hear that and it doesn't make a whole lot. You want me to find joy in, in going through trials? Well, the first thing to consider is what he, is the first part of that. He says, consider it joy when you go through trials. Notice that the, the word he uses, he doesn't say, well, consider those of you who might go through some trials in life, you consider it joy. If a trial should come in your life, 
go ahead and, and find joy in that. He says when. So what he is saying there is there is no doubt, my brothers and sisters, that trials will come. And when those trials come, he's saying consider it joy. Now, what exactly does he mean by that? He is now what James is not saying is that you you go to God and you pray, oh, God, please send some trials into my life. God, I am so thankful that my house burned down. I'm so glad that my spouse left me. I'm really happy that my dog ran away. No, he isn't. This is not a bad country song that he's talking about. here. No, that would be a bad country song. Don't get me wrong. There are some good country songs. I like country music. But your house burning down, your spouse leaving you, and your dog running away, that's a bad country song, okay? And, and, and what, what, what J- James is not saying, pray to God and say, I find so much joy in these bad things that are happening to me. That is not what he's saying. What James is saying is find joy as you go through the trial. Not in the trial itself, but as you are going through the trial, find joy. How do I do that? How is it that I'm going through these difficult times and I can find joy? Well, what he wants us to understand is that we have something that others don't. And that is, as you are going through that trial, if you are a servant of Christ, if you are one who has given yourself over to God, then you don't have to go through that trial by yourself. As you are walking along in that trial, walking right alongside of you is God. How many of you have ever read the poem Footprints? Okay, so you know. That, that shows us what trials are all about because, and for those of you that don't know the poem, it goes like this. There's a gentleman and he sees flashes of his life going before him. And during most of these flashes, he sees two sets of footprints. But as he's looking at these flashes of his life go by, he notices that at the most difficult times of his life, during the greatest trials of his life, there's only one set of footprints. And so he walks up to Jesus. He says, why is it that during the times when I needed you the most, that you left me alone? And Jesus says to him, that's not what happened. It is during those times, the reason that you only see one set of footprints is because during those times, I carried you. And that's what James is trying to get us to understand. And when you're going through these trials, you don't have to go through them alone. Why can you find joy? You can find joy because you have the God, the creator of the universe, who's walking alongside with you. So that's what he's trying to get us to understand to find joy as you go through those trials, which will come. And the longer you live, the more trials you will go through. So those of you who are in your teens and your early 20s and you think, wow, it's really been tough, keep living. (laughs) I'm 41 and I'm, I'm pretty sure those in their 80s are looking at me and saying, son, keep living. Just just keep living. The trials will come, but we can find pure joy because we have a God that walks alongside with us. And so as he goes on, he says, now as you're going through these trials, when he looks at the next verse, he says, persevere. Persevere because these trials are going to help you to become better. They're going to make you stronger. That's why he's saying persevere. Now, here's the problem. When we run into trials, you have two choices. Two choices. First choice, you can say, you know what? I can't deal with this, and you can quit. The second choice is you can decide to persevere, and as you persevere, what that's going to do, it will build Christian character. Here's the problem that we run into, especially in richer nations. That is that there are people who are more concerned with comfort than with building Christian character. They're more concerned with the plush stuff, all of the stuff, than they are with building Christian character. 
And when you get to the point where you are more concerned with the comfort than the Christian character, you start, when you go into a trial, you start asking the wrong questions. You're concerned with comfort. You start asking, God, why do I have to go through this? God, when will this be over? Because you're concerned with God, when can I be comfortable again? But if you're concerned with Christian character, you start to ask the right questions. God, as I'm going through this trial, could you please show me what I'm supposed to learn from this? God, as I'm going through this trial, can you please show me how I can get better through this? God, as I'm going through this trial, help me to persevere. Help me to grow. Help me to be better. And what happens as you go through the trial, you come out and you're stronger because of it. It's sort of like basically ex spiritual exercising. You know, if you want a muscle to get stronger, you exercise it. And any of you who say that exercise is fun, tell the truth. No, it is not. It hurts. It is not fun being out of breath. But what happens is you become stronger, you become better, you become able to do more because of the exercise. And it's the same way with trials. When you go through them, you become better, you become stronger, you become able to deal with more things in life. And you become a person who can be a blessing to someone else. Give you an example. There was this woman, her name was Anastasia Bell really bright and brilliant young woman. At 33 years old, Anastasia was diagnosed with breast cancer. And so she goes through all of the things that you go through when you get that diagnosis of breast cancer and she gets the mastectomy and all is well. It, 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 all, it all clears up. Ten years later, shortly after her 43rd birthday, Anastasia gets diagnosed with breast cancer again. And she goes through all of that, all of the treatments, all of all everything she has to go through, second mastectomy, and all, gets all of that taken care of. And you talk to her and you ask her, how was it the second time? She says, oh, it was easier. I said, wait a minute, when you talk about cancer here, what do you mean it was easier? She said, well, I've been through it once. I knew what to expect. I knew how to deal with it. I was stronger because I had already gone through that. A few years later, Anastasia's best friend gets what? Diagnosed with breast cancer. And so what Anastasia is able to do is she walks along with her best friend and helps to strengthen her best friend because she was able to help her because she knew she could understand, she could relate to what her friend was going through. And as she walked with her friend, God walked with her friend and they were able to lift each other up. And when they came to the other side of that trial, guess what? Her friend and Anastasia, they were stronger. Twenty years later, Anastasia is now in her late 60s. And her daughter gets diagnosed with breast cancer. And again, Anastasia and now her friend comes alongside too. And so they're all walking together as her daughter goes through this trial. But now she doesn't have to go through it alone. She has her mother and her mother's best friend, who she calls auntie. They're all walking along with her. And they're all helping to hold her up. And God is helping to hold all of them up. You see, when we go through these trials, we have to understand that it is not God being angry with us. It is not God punishing us for some great sin. Trials are going to come simply because of life. Sometimes they don't even have anything to do with us being a Christian. It's just life. When you live life, things happen. There are accidents that happen. There's sickness that happen. There, these things happen. And sometimes trials do come because of the fact that we have given our life to Christ. And that's because the enemy is angry and he's trying to stop us from achieving something that God wants us to achieve. 
But regardless, we can see our way through those trials, come out stronger, and then, who knows, a few years down the road, bless somebody else by being able to walk them through that situation as well. But I will admit, trials can be paralyzing. Sometimes you get into a situation and you don't know which way to go. You cannot possibly see a way out. You can't make a decision. So what should you do? Well, James is, James gives us the answer. He says, if you do not have wisdom, ask for it. Sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? Okay, I don't have wisdom. I don't have an answer. I'm going to ask for it. I'll just ask God. It sounds simple. But then we go to the next verse and he says, and don't doubt. And that's where we run into trouble. He says, don't doubt, because if you doubt, you're like a ship on the sea that's tossing back and forth. In other words, he's saying when you start to doubt, you get all confused. God's giving you the answer, but you, 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 you can't hear it because you doubt. Well, is, is that really what God wants me to do? Well, you know, it doesn't seem right. Well, you know, but God, maybe God can't hear me. No. He says, ask for wisdom if you don't have it. Don't doubt. Believe. Trust God. Trust and trust the answer that he's giving you. Sometimes we doubt because we're hearing the answer and we're saying, ah, oh, that's not the right answer. It's the answer that God gave. It's, it's the right answer. So if we don't have wisdom, we're to ask for it. We're to trust. We're to believe. And we are not to doubt. We're to trust that God will lead us in the right direction. We are to trust that God will walk with us. And there's a reward for that. That reward comes to us in verse 12. We're going to try and get verse 12 up on the screen and just look at it. Because I believe that when we look at this verse, it is the key to everything that James is trying to say in this first part. Let's look. It says, blessed is the man who perseveres. Blessed is that person who perseveres. In other words, blessed is the person who sticks to it. Blessed is the person who is able to get through these trials. Blessed is the person who's able to do the things that were necessary to survive through it. Because when they stood the test, they will receive the crown of life. In other words, when you withstand that test, there's a reward waiting on the other side. Now, you can look at it this way. In James, I would assume that James is talking about life being a tr one big trial. After another trial. After another trial. I had a, a, a preacher mentor tell me once that life comes in three stages. Either you are currently in a storm. You're coming out of a storm or you're going into another storm. Those are the three stages of life. I'm like, well, you know, that's, that's just, uh, that's, that's really encouraging, Pastor. I'm, thank you. But I think that when, when we look at what James is saying, he's looking at that life that way, and the crown that he is talking about is the reward of eternal life that awaits us in the end. And that's wonderful, because that is the way that we should look at life that that reward is waiting for us. However, I truly do believe that there are little jewels that we can put in that crown along the way as we continue to go through trials, come out, and become better people. We become better individuals. There, there is that reward of being able to grow within this life. I don't think that God intends for us to live this life and j just to wait for the life after. I, intend, I think that God intends for us to live this life to its fullest. And part of living this life to its fullest is becoming the best that we can be in living our life with God. It's not, and, and I'm not talking about this, this isn't some, uh, some talk where I'm just saying, okay, yeah, be, be the best that you can be. And no, the best that you can be with God. Because the best that you can be without God is not good at all. But if you can walk along through those trials and allow God to walk with you, that's the best 
that you can become. And when you do that, you're able to bring others along with you. You're able to help others through, through trials. You're able to go out and do what Christ told us to do. Go and make, make disciples. How do we do that? We do that because people are able to look at us and say, you know what? You've been through these things in your life. How is it that you can still praise God? Because, and you can say, because I wouldn't have made it through that situation had it not been for God. Peter says in his writings, you have to be ready for an answer. For the joy that is within you and that answer is God. He says we're going to be a peculiar people. People look at us and say, you know, those guys are crazy. How is it? How is it that? They can be smiling through the that, that sister has cancer. How is it that? She can smile that, that that entire town went through a tornado. How is why would anybody rebuild there? How is it that they can be so happy and so joyful? It's because of God. I started this sermon by talking about that second verse of Horatio Stafford's song, It Is Well With My Soul. Now hear that entire verse and you begin to understand the reward that we have already received. He says, Though Satan may buffet, though trials may come, that this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate. And here's the important part. And has shed his own blood for my soul. Christ shed his blood for my soul. I don't know about you, but that makes me excited that Christ loved me so much that he was willing to hang on a cross and bleed and die for my soul. And not only does he do that, he's saying, okay, I, I hung on that cross. I bled and I died for you. And now when you're going through those hard and difficult times, I'm not going to leave you alone. I will walk right along with you. So when those times of trial come, you can remember that Christ shed his own blood for your soul. You can remember that as you're going through that trial, you have a God that is right there with you. You can remember when those times when it seems that you're down, you have a God that will lift you up. And so don't ask, why me? Don't ask. When will this be over? Ask God, give me the wisdom to be able to see how I can become better through this trial. God, give me the wisdom to be able to see how I can become stronger through this trial. God, give me the wisdom to remember that it is well with my soul. I don't know about you. But I'm, I'm happy that it's well with my soul. I'm happy that God loves me the way that he did. I don't know what trials you are going through. I don't know, you may be in the midst of a trial right now, but know that it is well with your soul. The fact of the matter is, I'll just say this, if it is, if you truly do believe that God is with you and it is well with your soul, then we should praise him. We should put our hands together and praise God with a hand clap of praise. If it is well with your soul, you should be willing to give him a verbal praise of hallelujah. If it is well with your soul, you should be able to say, thank you, 